This is an interview with Bryda Driggs Britton for the Charles Ray Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University at her home in Mesa, Arizona on October the 15th, 1982 at 117 and my name is Jesse Embry. First of all, tell me what you remember about your very early childhood. What are your very earliest memories? Uh, my earliest memory mm -hmm. is living in a little log cabin down in the trees mm -hmm. in Driggs, Idaho. Mm -hmm. I was the first girl born in the town of Driggs, mm -hmm. and it was a later named for my father mm -hmm. and his brothers. Mm -hmm. And we had the a beautiful stream of water not very far off where there's lots of fish and uh, beautiful quake and ash trees. Mm -hmm. Just a second. I Gone, I'm sorry. Now do you want me to start right from the beginning? That's fine. Why don't you start from the beginning? We, I was born in a little town of Driggs, Idaho mm -hmm. before it was had any name. Mm -hmm. I was the first girl born in this town. Eighty-nine years next, twenty-fourth of October, mm -hmm. and uh, we lived close to a beautiful little stream with fishing and a beautiful meadow. And uh, I used to love to go with mother down in this meadow and pick strawberries, wild strawberries. Mm -hmm. When I became a little older. Mm -hmm. We lived there for just a few years, and Father built a beautiful new home. And uh, by then it was time the children were starting to school. We didn't have any schoolhouse. So my father built a two-story home, and our first school was in the upstairs of my father's home. Mm -hmm. I, uh, used to think it was kind of hard because I could tend the baby until the, door, the bell rang and then I could get to school on time. The other kids could come early and they could play. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it wasn't very long, just a few years until we had a beautiful new home. And uh, because there wasn't any schoolhouse, father left the upstairs and that's where we had our first school, mm -hmm. was in the upstairs of Father's home. Then, uh, and I don't know what detail you want me to go into as much detail. And then we, they built a nice, a log schoolhouse about a block from there. And then Father finished this upstairs. And that's where we entertained so many of the general authorities of the church. Mm -hmm. In uh, 1901, Joseph F. Smith came to our conference and he established the Driggs Ward mm -hmm. and put my father in his first as superintendent of the Sunday School, then as the bishop of the Rexburg Ward, and in 1901 they established the Teton Valley Stake and the Teton Valley and the Driggs Ward. They named it after their father and his brothers. And that's why I felt my childhood, and it seemed to me that it was just so beautiful to have all the advantages that we did that so many other people didn't have. And we didn't think anything about all this cold and snow and everything because we'd had it in Pleasant Grove, Utah, you know. So it just, it just seemed natural to me. We lived there then until, uh, well, I had to go away for the eighth grade had to go to Rick's Academy for the eighth grade because we didn't have, I was the only student in the eighth grade. 
so I went to school at Brooks Academy and graduated from there in 1911. And my one brother, Junius, just the next to the last of my family, became very ill. He had was paralyzed all over. Thought that he never could. Well, the doctor said if he lived, he never could do anything. And uh, they didn't advise him to even try too hard to keep him because it would be so hard. But he did live. And so when it was time for me to go to school, I said, Mother, I can't go to school. And they were here with two babies. She had new baby girls. But uh, they insisted. And I went to school at Rexburg then for four years and graduated in 1911. Mm -hmm. And of course, I can see now how important it was to have an education like that. And then after graduation, I uh, was just free and just looking forward to a lot of good times mm -hmm. when the bishop got up in sacrament meeting and put me in as president of the MIA. Mm -hmm. That was before I was 18 years old. I remember I knew I couldn't do it. There was no way that a girl like me could do that job. So I just shed tears for two or three days and my father came in and found me crying and he said I want you to understand that the church doesn't wait on anybody you were put in as president mutual Sunday night's coming that's when he always held it Sunday night he says you have to have your program ready your officers chosen your You've got to be on the job all the long rest of your life. So of course I got busy and got my everything ready for Sunday night. And from then on we found out what a wonderful thing it was to be responsible for an organization like that. And of course we got good counselors and the young men were wonderful and we had such a such a successful time by then we had enough people to have mutual and have a stake and uh, and then I went on to the stake board of the mutual and uh, fell in love and got married <laughs> and uh, I'd never heard the name of Brinton before. I didn't know how important the church was to him or anything. So when he started talking about getting married, I just had to find out if he could go to the temple. He was in another ward by then. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I've ever insulted anyone in my life like he was insulted to question me. You think I'd mar ask a girl to bury me if I couldn't take it to the temple? Mm -hmm. So we were married and we've had a wonderful marriage life. We stayed there until we'd had three of our children in Victor, Idaho. We stayed there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, President Lesweer from Mesa got my father president of the Teton State to come and visit down here. And I wanted my husband to come and see it. And so did my father. He said, I couldn't move any place if we didn't take you because I was the only girl for so many years. But uh, he didn't want to come. He said, we've got everything we want here. What do we want? We have a nice home, three beautiful children, a good job, good business, and 
1911. No, that was 21. There wasn't many people that had a car. Mm -hmm. But we had two cars, one for me and one for him. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't interested in coming, so the telephone rang and said to get Van Sings in the suitcase quick. He's decided to go to Arizona with your dad. So I hurried up and five minutes here and there said it won't matter to go down and look. That made me have to stay. But they got back in January to five feet of snow and 50 below zero and do down here in Mesa. Cotton was selling for a dollar and a quarter a pound. They were going to make their, well, they could make the price of the land about the first year or two. So we came, sold everything we had. We bought one car with us in our furniture. This china closet here came from Idaho that long ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, planted, we had the most beautiful field of cotton I've ever seen. 160 acres, mm -hmm. and when it was uh, selling at a dollar and a quarter a pound, and by the time it was ready to harvest, this market had gone all out of control, and they couldn't even pick it. They couldn't pick it for 20 cents a pound, and so we lost everything we had. Everything went into that. But uh, my husband got a job, my father got a job, and it wasn't very long. They were with the Utah Savings and Loan, my father was. And very soon he decided that he'd been a banker all his life. So we just as well have one of our own. Mm -hmm. And by then my husband was working in New York Life, so mm -hmm. they went ahead and started Western Savings mm. and Loan. And it's now the biggest savings and loan in Arizona. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but then stayed with the New York Life. But uh, we borrowed money on our insurance and put in Western savings. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when they had to have more war, we sold our insurance mm -hmm. and put it all in the Western savings. But then we got more insurance, of course. And uh, so now today, Western savings is the biggest in the city. But we don't have very much stock in it now. Uh, about four years before my husband died, he said, I want, I want to give this stock to the children, the grandchildren, while I'm here, mm -hmm. and not have them, not leave it to them. And so he decide, divided all this among his 36 grandchildren. And uh, nearly every one of them, well, they're not every one because they're still, some of them are young. But most of them have been able to sell that stock and have a good home to live in. So that was our financial deal down here. We went to, uh, we started with New York Life down in Douglas, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And uh, very short time after we were there, they were just getting, they were just a branch then of the California Mission. And they put Van in as president of the mutual and me president of the primary. Mm -hmm. So it gave us a good start. <laughs> work we had to do. And then we, and the temple, we were here when the temple site was dedicated. And we came back 
who had the laying of the cornerstone we came back from Douglas for the laying of the cornerstone and then when the temple was really going up and we knew there was going to be one two years before it opened we came back then asked for uh, to be able to work here and they said no we had plenty here and he said okay that's all right me I'm going to live in Mesa you can give me that let me work with New York Life or I'll get another job so of course they let him work here and so we've lived here ever since and we just loved it in Mesa and it's been such a wonderful place to raise a family and the church has been so good to us it's uh, made us work we just had seemed like they just called on us for everything they wanted mm -hmm. and as my father said the church puts you in and then you work and it it has done so much for us and for our family we have uh, 36 grandchildren, 30 of them married all in the temple and all active in the church six more to go one is coming home from his mission in December and then there's just one more to go on a mission and it's given us responsible positions all along the way and worked on the state mutual board and uh, Brother Delbert Stapley was president of the stake here then and later he was an apostle but uh, all the time he was in Van worked with him and that was uh, taking care of the Mazona dances you wouldn't perhaps know the Mazona but it was a big church dance hall mm -hmm. and it was a it's the only real big they came from all over the valley to the dances there and they didn't have to be members we think that we had about 50 percent members because everybody wanted to come to Mazona mm -hmm. and he did that for 15 years and then uh, someone else took it for a couple of years and they didn't get along so well with it so my son Dilworth was put in and he managed it for 12 years so Dan was on the state board all that time and uh, I was in the stake primary and helped a lot with that and then uh, a little later I was counselor of the stake primary and then stake president for four years mm -hmm. <coughs> Then for a year or two I was out because of ill health. But they put me right back in Relief Society and I was counselor there for four years and then president for eight years. And four years out of that time I was regional representative and we had the we met with all the stakes in Arizona. There were ten stakes. Mm -hmm then in Arizona and New Mexico and Texas mm -hmm. and we met with all those every three months up at Globe in Miami mm -hmm. President Wright who is now president of the temple was the president of the stake and I worked with him and that was at the time the finish of the world war and we were asked to gather the clothes to send overseas mm -hmm. and uh, when we had them all ready to go we worked six months in the storehouse bishop storehouse now mrs emmett had judge of the bishop storehouse <coughs> and she did tremendous work everybody that could went to the storehouse and helped 
And when we had it ready to say that we had 13 tons of clothing that had been washed and cleaned and dry cleaned and mended and ready to send overseas. I just say I've just been going over this because I, mm -hmm. I put it down in my book or I have a book with it all in. Mm -hmm. And so those are some of the things that helped me to begin the of the year. Mm -hmm. Now what Let's go back and talk some more about your childhood and then work up to, oh. to that point. Well, um, it, was a, it was a wonderful childhood. Father and mother were both so busy in church work, Father President of the State by then. So we always had the authorities of the church stay in our home. We did have a nice home in Driggs. Mm -hmm. And they could fix it. I know Mother just, it seemed to me like half our life was spent getting ready for church, for conference. Mm -hmm. Because the authorities always stayed with us. That's what I'm working rising right now. All these authorities of the church that meant so much in our lives and they'd always come to our home to stay and the first one that I remember was in 1901 when Joseph F. Smith came and organized the Teton Stake mm -hmm. and he put my father in his present of the stake mm -hmm. and it was right after that that uh, Lorenzo Snow died and then he was president of the church. Mm -hmm. So he stayed in our home and it seemed like Mother just had, I had put it down, it had, you'd have a sheet when they were coming, the authorities, she'd have four or five cakes and half a dozen pies and everything ready because she couldn't possibly miss a meeting. Mm -hmm. She had to get all of them. So I remember Joseph F. Smith coming. That was the year I was baptized. And how thrilled we were that we had a general authority in our home. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tell me some more about the general authority, some other general authorities that you remember. Well, uh, after Joseph F. Smith, there was Heber J. Grant. Mm -hmm. uh, Heber J. Grant married my father's cousin. I have her picture right here someplace. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we knew them real well. And father had, they were, had both come from Pleasant Grove, so father knew the family very well. And uh, the next one I remember so distinctly was uh, David O. McKay. Now David O. McKay was, he was such a brilliant man and he was one of the younger authorities and they used to send the younger ones up there because it was, they'd come to Rexburg on the train and then we'd have to go out and meet them. And they'd come 50 miles in a horse and buggy. That would just take 12 hours. Mm travel over dirty, rutty roads. And he used to come there quite a bit. So in later years, I don't know, 15 years ago, I guess, he was at conference in Phoenix. And I took mother over to conference because I told her that I knew that President McKay would like to see her because he'd been at our home so many times. And she said, oh, he wouldn't even remember me. But anyway, we started up, and just as we got the foot of the steps, President McKay was up there after church, you know, shaking hands with everybody, and he saw Mother. And he just parted the people there and met her at the top of the stairs. And Mother was so tiny, and he just put his hands under her arms and picked her up like that and kissed her. He was such a big man and she was so tiny. Mm -hmm. And then he turned to me and he said, and how are you, Vida? 
and how Elwood Lynn, Elwood and Lynn were the ones that uh, used to go for him in the buggy and be with him 12 hours. Mm -hmm. And so that was a wonderful thing to be with him. And then a few years later, when George Albert Smith was president of the uh, was a president of the church. He wasn't president then, but he was later on. But he was an apostle, and he came to our conference. And Father had invited them ahead of time. If they would prepare for it, he'd take them through Yellowstone National Park after conference. Mm -hmm. And so they came, and the B.H. Roberts and his wife came with them. And then you couldn't take a car in the Yellowstone Park at all, had to go by horse and buggy. So they had their own horse and buggy, and then we had a, a camper to put all the bedding and things in because we had to make our own beds, you know, sleep. This was in the 1980. And uh, so they came and they stayed the rest of the week after conference. We went over the hill to Jackson's Hall and had conference there. That was in our state. Mm -hmm. And then the next day or two we went up to... Hmm. Anyway, the next time <laughs> it was a few homes and had conference there and then off through the park and it took us three weeks to go by horse and buggy and see all these things and I'm sure we see, saw much more than you see now going through in two or three hours mm -hmm. because every night we had to we stopped and had to do all our own cooking make our own beds and pack our things in the morning and every night we were able to sit around the campfire and listen to these wonderful men and uh, they had us as kids they had us doing things too you know so that was quite a wonderful thing so many many years later President George Albert Smith was here at conference. My dead mother was gone. But I went up and spoke to him. And he said, Vida, I know it's you. But how on earth did you ever get all the way from Driggs, Idaho, down to Mesa, Arizona? All those years he'd remembered me. <laughs> and then it was, uh, he was the one that set me apart. And I was called to be a temple worker. He was there and did that then. And I didn't know President Lee. I had met him, but that was all. I didn't have any particular thing with him. But uh, Brother Kimball, who is now the president of the church, I didn't realized this at the beginning that uh, I hurried home from Salt Lake and drove all the way down here to get my oldest son in school down at Tucson the first year college for him and uh, then they didn't have dormitories he was going to stay at a home and uh, people had offered you know you could they'd take him and, and he was going to stay at the Kimball home so I took Bill down to Tucson for his school and the first thing that the Kimball did said well now you're related to us he got his books out and showed me and uh, President Kimball's grandfather Mm, Kimball was that. <laughs> anyway, he married my father's sister, my grandfather's sister. Mm -hmm. And so I am a second cousin to Spencer W. Kimball. Mm -hmm. 
So when I saw him a few months ago, he put his arm around me and he says, don't you ever forget you're related to me. Of course, we have a lot of things that happened in between because we've known the Kimballs, but we knew them ever since then. Mm -hmm. And we knew some of the Kimballs before, but we didn't realize that we were that close relatives. So that worked out pretty good. And last time I saw him, maybe I said that, he said, don't you ever forget to relate it to me. Mm -hmm. So I, and his wife is in our daughter's tiny, I mean his brother's wife, the one that told me about being related to the Kimball. She's in our daughter's of the pioneers. So I get to see her every month. She doesn't live far from here, but she's in another ward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me some more about your father. About father? Mm -hmm. My father led this group of people. He'd heard about the Teton Valley, and uh, or he'd heard about going up there, and he led a group of people up and settled in this little town right in the center of the valley. And uh, as Howard Wallace and uh, As Howard Wallace and uh, Pratt and Father and Wallace for Ben that decided to go up there and investigate and those four men were the ones that started it. If you need those names, there was Howard Wallace. I could give them to you by looking at them. And they were the ones that started it, and, uh, and of course people began to hear about this wonderful, beautiful little valley, and it is just a beautiful valley. Don't know whether you've ever been there or not. If you haven't, up just 50 miles from Rexburg. And uh, so that's where they built. As I said, Father was the first Sunday school superintendent, they organized the Sunday school first, and then uh, when they put a bishop in, made a ward out of it, our father was the bishop, and then it was a stake, and father was the stake president, and he was that for 20 years. And I remember twice he told us he felt like he'd been in long enough they should get someone else. And he suggested it to them, and all they did was give him two different counselors. Mm. And uh, Albert Schultz came about that time, and he was, uh, he wasn't married. He said, I was just at the stage where I'd got all the education I felt like I needed, and all I wanted to do was work in the morning, have a good time in the afternoon, go out with girls at night. And to the, almost before I knew it, President Driggs had me in his council in the state presidency. Because I couldn't do half these things that I wanted to do, but I found out the other things were so important. And uh, so he, he was there when Father was came to Arizona, and he became the second state president of the Teton Valley. And then uh, he came down here, and his son came down here, and he was put in state president down here. And uh, now he's president of the mission in New York City. <laughs> 
it shows what what the church will do to you if you let it. What did your father do for an occupation in Driggs? Well, he had a big farm, and then he had a store, a mercantile store he established, and my uncle had a, uh, I guess, the overall kind of implements for farming things of that sort. And Uncle Ben was a lawyer and Uncle uh, Parley did farming mostly. And this Uncle Parley's, you ever hear about Gifford Nielsen on, mm -hmm. well, this is his grandfather. Mm -hmm. And Gifford, I have a picture of him with his mother now. And he's one of the descendants of Uncle Parley's Triggs. And they had very successful with their with their farming. Nearly all of them had some land beside the work they did. Mm -hmm. I don't know what well father helped a lot with schools, I remember he was on the school board along with other things. And all the old timers had to do, they had to be on nearly everything. Mm -hmm. No, and of course they had quite a bit of Indian trouble. Mm -hmm. And father made friends with the Indians. And mm -hmm. So they got along very well with that. And there's any other do you remember some of the Indian troubles? Were you around when they were having it? Well, I remember Mother taking us down in the meadow under some trees and making us beds down there and let us sleep down there because the men were off, uh, kind of warding off trouble with the Indians. But Father had a pretty good way with the Indians. He let them know he was friends. <laughs> They didn't have a whole lot of trouble that way. Tell me some about your mother. Tell me about your mother. Oh, well, mother is just a miracle to me. She wasn't early. She came about up to here. She was a little tiny woman. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I never saw anybody so full of pep and vigor and do. She entertained for 20 years. She entertained the authorities of the church every three months. Mm -hmm. And she always had the pantry full of good things to eat because she couldn't possibly miss an eating mm -hmm. just to feed people. And yet she always had, I remember Father, when he could, would kill either a small pig or a lamb or something, or maybe it would be beef. They'd kill their own, you know, to have plenty to feed the authorities when they came. They all seemed to love to come there, and even the counselors didn't get homes nice enough to always have the authorities stay with them. And Mother just, she was just a marvel. She was a state primary president up there, and after she came to Mesa, she was president of the state here, and that included the whole Phoenix and all. And Phoenix and Pine and Prescott and mm -hmm. all these outside. She used to, Father used to take her on these trips clear up to Prescott and Globe to visit state primary. She was very well known and very, very much loved. And they were, they helped, and so did I help, to take the first session through the Arizona Temple when it was dedicated. Mm -hmm. I was astonished that I would be called because I was expecting a baby. And most of the people called were kind of through with their, you know, of having a baby. Mm -hmm. But I worked three years then, and then when another baby was coming, I had to quit. But then, 
when we were in Douglas, then I told you he wanted to be here for the dedication. So he asked if he couldn't work up here. They said, no, you can go to Globe in Miami or some other place with Mount Mesa. He says, that's okay with me. We're going to live in Mesa if you want me to work for it. All right, why? Not why. I'll get another job. So they said, go ahead. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit more about your mother. Um, oh. Yeah. Well, Tell, go ahead. She was one of the very active ones in the temple. She just, by then her family were all raised, you know, and she could give her time, she and father. Mm -hmm. And father was far enough along with his business so he could spend time there. He, he could take any part there was to take. Of course, then we didn't have movies, you know, everybody was there personally. And uh, they took the part of the man and the woman, you know, so many, so much of the time. The other day I just read the, I think it was Brother Ellsworth, but I'm not sure, it doesn't matter. They came down from taking his big session through and, you know, it had been hours and I said, Mother sat down on bed and said, <coughs> Makes me so darn mad to think I get so tired doing this wonderful work. <laughs> she didn't like it. Didn't like to be so tired doing it. But when Father died, they were living in Phoenix, and so they sold that home and built a little duplex right across the road from the temple. Two little duplex. She lived in one and rented three. So from then on, of course she was the father. They helped to take the first session through. Mm -hmm. And so did I. And I'm the only one left now. Mm -hmm. It was a worker then. Did, what was a, a, your a, a usual day like for your mother? What types of things did she have to do, particularly in Driggs? Tell me about cooking and washing and those kinds of things? Well, uh, I remember that Mother always had a washing machine. A lot of the people just used the washboard. But Mother always had a washing machine. And uh, so often the boys wanted to go fishing or something, but they had to stay home and turn that washer. Mm -hmm. And that kind of hurt their feelings, but as they grew older, they could realize what it meant. So I think she'd, we always had hired help for the work on the farm. So mother always had extra people to feed besides just the family. And she did it without a grumble, I remember. When she'd put a roast in the oven, father'd have to lift it and put it in for her because she couldn't lift it. It was so heavy. She mm -hmm. cook a 10-pound roast. I've seen her put in 10-pound roast so many times. And then, of course, we always had lots of potatoes and vegetables up there to cook. And she was expert at making pies and fruit cake and nut cake and mince meat pie and all these things. There's, she seemed to be expert in near, nearly every line beside taking care of all the visitors and, and being state primary president and traveling all over. And she did the same thing down here. She was right busy doing all of it. And uh, Tell me about some of the chores that you helped with in the house up in Driggs. Well, of course, was having 10 or 12 for breakfast every morning. Hay men and other 
there was always dishes to do. I remember it took us sometimes till about 11 o'clock before we got through with all the dishes we had to do. And then we'd have to start to peeling potatoes because of course I guess every place potatoes are one of the big one of the big things they have. Maybe not so much now, but then <coughs> we could get a hundred pounds for I think they were ten cents a pound or something. I don't know, maybe I couldn't tell you maybe how much they were, but there was always a hundred pounds of potatoes in the house. You could use all of those you wanted to, and then father raised lots of sheep and pigs, and we killed a lot of those, and mother would dry them and make bacon and all those things that they did in early days, and then we always had a big garden, and grew lots of the food and mother would put that up either dry it or bottle it and uh, if nobody else was there to do it she could play the organ or the piano for all the singing and she could tell stories to all the kids and other classes it seemed like she was an all around mother and leader. Did she ever work outside the home? Did she ever do any work outside the home? Uh, no, there was no place for her to work. Mm -hmm. There was no time for her to work outside mm -hmm. of the home. She helped father in the store sometimes, mm -hmm. but not as a paid worker or anything. She did clerking and things like that? Mm -hmm. Oh yes, she could do anything like that or change, make change, or mm -hmm. mother had had a college education at the college in Salt Lake before she was married. When you or your brothers or sisters did something you weren't supposed to do, did your father or your mother do the discipline? Well, I think it was mostly mother. Mm -hmm. I was a, I think father was pretty lenient to everybody. From his own kids to the neighbor's kids to, but he was so kind and good to them that they always wanted to do what he wanted them to do. He was, he was the leader in the Teton Valley for 20 years and he was president of the state and had been for 10 years before that. Tell me some more about your father's store. Well, it, uh, I remember they used to have quite a lot of dry goods in. Calico and gingham were the big things. Mm -hmm. And uh, the calico was generally kind of a figured material and the gingham was quite a lot of it was squares or plaids and things like that. And there wasn't a big variety of things like there is today. But I remember they had lots of stuff on the shelves of that store and father was called on a mission to go up into Montana. He was gone for three months, I think. If I'd look it up, I could tell you how many people they converted, but I don't know exactly where it is. But they had a lot of people converted. Then Father came home, and just soon as we came home, why the stir caught on fire and burned everything to the ground. I remember standing up and watching it burning. Oh, I wish I could run in there and get some of those dolls that were in there. <laughs> they had Christmas stuff in already. But uh, with the insurance on it, they started up again. 
had that. We had the same happen to us. I still burned down after I was married. And uh, somebody borrowed a wheelbarrow and brought it back and didn't put it inside, and that's the only thing we saved. Mm -hmm. So we thought then that Dan says, well, I'll have to go out to St. Anthony that 50 miles for our insurance, see what we have. And he said, you just well go and stay with your mother there too, because in the winter up there we couldn't leave. It would freeze. Mm -hmm. Are you from Rexburg? Or from or Logan. Logan. So it's, uh, not nearly as cold there as it was up in Rexburg and Griggs. So uh, he said, you just well go down there while I'm out of town. Because we won't be staying here now, our store's gone. So I went down to Mother's. He came back two days later ready to start Mother's store with the insurance. Mm -hmm. And everything in the house was frozen. They had to uh, disconnect the hot water. By then we did have water connected. We had to disconnect that because if you, when the water in the tank was all frozen, it would blow up. So Van's brother said, oh, I can cure that in a hurry, do it with electricity. <laughs> Every time you touch anything, you get a shock. We had all of next spring, we had to go to the river to get our water. They'd bring it to us on a little sled, 50-gallon barrel. One day I wasn't there and he left it outside, so I had 50 gallons of ice. And I had to get another barrel. And it took us two or three months before we could get the electricity out of it. I couldn't hang any clothes on the clothesline because they were metal. We had to have the inside I used to call it a, a, that kind of a horse. Anyway, that we could hang things on that weren't metal. The only way we could dry anything. So there's a lot of things that make me glad I live down here. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the things you did with your brothers and sisters when you were younger. I know what? Tell me about the things that you did with your brothers and sisters when you were younger, when you were small. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in the winter we used to play a lot in the snow and build snow houses. We'd build one big enough to then take all the inside out. We'd have a little, more like a teepee or something. We'd have that, and you go in there, and it was warm. You know, the snow would protect it. We did that a lot, and then we went to skating. And, uh, of course, as soon as we got old enough, we danced. And, and there was all the mutual programs to prepare, and take care of and they put on lots of plays and had lots of parties and went sleigh riding. You could put a dozen people in a sleigh and just put two of your quilts on the bottom and set on those and cover up with our more quilts. Go sleighing and then we'd go coasting, we'd go up on the hill and then climb up and slide down. Seemed like there was always plenty to do. Mm -hmm. 
How many brothers and sisters did you have? I had two sisters and five, six brothers, but two, the oldest sister died and the brother just younger than me. So there were seven of us that grew up. And then we waited for a baby's sister then for 16 years. Each time a baby would come, I'd want a sister, and each time I'd get a brother. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the last baby was coming, Father said, now if this baby's a girl, I'm going to buy the most beautiful baby basket, baby buggy in town. Said the boy, we're going to use the little red wagon. So we got a girl. And he got this beautiful baby buggy and brought it home. And we already had a cradle. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but uh, just about that time was when this, my brother June, <coughs> became so ill, so he had the cradle and she had the baby bath. Mm -hmm. And everybody just idolized her. I think the whole valley was so thrilled. Mm -hmm. You want this stuff. Everybody just loved Virginia, and if ever a child should have been spoiled, she should, but it never affected her at all. Mm -hmm. She grew up and married and had a wonderful companion, raised a good family, and then she died with cancer in 1950. So she lived such a short life, and I've lived such a long one, we don't know why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was wonderful to have her, and then he married again. He didn't think he could. She told him he'd have to, but he didn't think he would. And uh, this little baby that was, she found out, they tried to get it, said they'd try to keep her alive till the baby came. And he was seven years old when she died. And a few days later, the father got them all off to school in the morning. By then, the oldest girl was, you know, big enough to do cement. And came home that night, and this little boy, just in kindergarten, I guess, they'd sent him home from school. He broke out with measles after he got to school. And they'd send him home. He got home all right, but there was nobody there. Nobody to call him. He just went to bed and stayed there with a hot fever all day. And Harold Clark, I don't know whether you know that name or not. He said he knew then that he had to have a wife, that he couldn't possibly raise him alone. So he married Mary Dean. And they've had a good life together. You see, Virginia died in 1950. That's 32 years ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, he's had a stroke now, and he's in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And uh, my son Dillwood had a stroke about a month or two before Harold did. But he's getting around doing everything. He can't begin to do all the things he used to do, but he just got home night before last from a trip to New England, I guess, back to New York. And we had word yesterday that Margaret Brinton had died. So he left this morning, five o'clock, to go up to the funeral. So he's, uh, he's getting along a lot better than Harold. Harold is still in a wheelchair. When your mother had her babies, did she have a midwife? Yes. Tell me about what you remember about the midwife coming. Well, the midwife always came, and then whoever was there could help her with the babies coming. I've helped with a number of them that way. 
after I was married, but I always had a nurse and a doctor by the time we got together, you know. But Grandma Enan was the one that officiated when I was born and two or four of the others. She'd just take care of everything there was and if somebody had to help her, it didn't really always be a sister or sister-in-law or somebody to help. Mm -hmm. And then they'd bathe the mother and baby and then stay with them for about 10 days. And then we had to keep them. We had to keep down in bed then for 10 days. Supposed to by the time we're ready to get up, we're so weak from laying down that we. Mm -hmm. But I had to stay in bed with all of mine. But I had a doctor with all of mine. <coughs> when you were small and someone got sick in the family, who took care of you? Well, mother did if she was well enough, and a lot of her aunt and had come in, or some of the others. Just the, whoever was around, and uh, we had an epidemic of diphtheria. Mm -hmm. My oldest sister died of that. Mm -hmm. Son lost three and four children of that. It, uh, somebody came in that had been exposed to it, and they didn't let anybody know. And then when they came down sick, why, everybody in town was, had a chance of having that disease, and so many did. Some lost two and three and four children. Now they lost the one daughter, Irma. And then later she lost the little son, named after Father Don Carlos. Were there some other illnesses that you had that you can remember in your childhood? Well, of course, everybody just about had a whooping cough and measles. And uh, what was it was called? It not the flu. It's uh, influenza. What? The influenza. Mm-hmm. And they'd all get that. I guess. And then pneumonia was high too. They used to get lots of pneumonia. Now they lost the two children. What were some of the home remedies that you had for those? Well, I remember paragoric, and why I remember it, I don't know. I went to a doctor. I have a son-in-law who's a doctor, but he's a surgeon. 